With all the bad news about prices these days, it's nice to know that Adam and Eve is still offering the best deal out there. Adam and Eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy. It's got toys, games, movies, and so much more. Whether you're single and looking to impress a new partner, or you're in a relationship and you need to spice up your sex life, Adam and Eve has what you need. They've been at the top of the adult retail chain for decades, and there's a reason for that. Now my listeners will get 50% off of any one item, and that's not all. You also get three bonus sexy items and six movies for free, plus free shipping. No matter what you choose from the privacy of your own home, you can rest assured that it will be shipped to you in discreet packaging. So go to adamandeve.com, select any one item at 50% off, plus enjoy three sexy gifts and free shipping with the code HOLLY. That's adamandeve.com and use code HOLLY. You have to use my code in order to get this special deal. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered in my new studio. Will we stay here? Who knows? I'm kind of like a bit of a traveler with various studios in the Los Angeles area. But for now, we're going to call this home. Um, Today, I have esteemed journalist for XBiz, Gustavo Turner. But before we launch into our conversation, I just want to give a quick shout out to my new Patreon members, and I want to welcome them. Um, Norbert, Richard, OFC77, Polly, Rob, Preston, Robert, Christian, and Cedric. Thank you guys so much for joining my Patreon and supporting this podcast. I really appreciate it. So, Gustavo, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Uh, Thank you so much for coming back. I know we really love having you on because you're such an enormous wealth of information with all the important um, issues that are affecting the adult industry. And, uh, you know, we're getting towards the end of the year. We just had the midterms. So how do you feel about this year that just passed some of the results that we've seen from these elections? And what do you think we're going to be looking forward to or not looking forward to next year? Well, as I think we've talked about this the other times that I've been here that, um, there's a strange situation that happens every two years because the electoral pro- process in America results in every two years you get an election year. And uh, a lot of the politics that are around uh, pornography or, or adult content are part of uh, the culture wars. And they have been for a long, long time since the, uh, you know, well, for centuries really but like since the 60s it has become more and more part of uh how some of the people who are in the political spectrum are characterizing um social problems or social ills by connecting them to the availability of sexual material so every two years we get a a reviving of that and and especially at the rhetorical level where people are giving speeches and and making statements uh, that then may or may not translate into actual legislation or actual um, court cases uh, or political decisions by the courts, which we are seeing more and more, uh, both at the appellate level and at the Supreme Court level. Mm -hmm. So what do you think have been, has there been anything that's happened so far this year that has surprised you? I mean, I think that we are in a in an interesting uh, in between stage right now after the 2020 election uh, and people predicting what was going to happen in the 2022 election that were slightly off. They were predicting a much bigger Republican win than actually ended up happening. Um, I think that one of the most interesting and, and perhaps uh, not good things for for the adult industry and, and for the for for sexual expression in general was the election in Ohio, in Ohio of JD Vance 
because J.D. Vance is somebody who has uh, stated he's looking for the outright abolition of pornography, prohibition, total prohibition of pornography, which is a discourse that not even not even a group like Encosi, which has that mission, has been stating so openly recently. Uh, I mean, we are seeing a lot of attacks on what a lot of people in the right are calling pornography, uh, which are just books uh, in libraries that have maybe LGBTQ material or maybe race-related material, and it contains some elements of sexuality, and they're calling it a right hardcore pornography. So th there's been a, a lot of... Um, the discourse around pornography has become more and more uh, prevalent in the right in particular. Um, I think that the Van selection is interesting because if you couple him with somebody like Josh Howley uh, from Missouri, who has also been sounding like this war on porn alarm now for, for several years. Now we have two very, very high profile, very, uh, the, the media is paying attention to both of them, Howley and Vance, uh, senators from uh, the Midwest, who are very much openly advocating different versions of total abolition of pornography or total um, eradication of pornography. Um, it's a discourse that comes hand in hand with, uh, with trying to revive obscenity statutes. Uh, and also um, we are seeing a lot of ramping up of the discourse around the word prurient, which is a very interesting word that is at the core of a lot of the uh, First Amendment issues concerning sexual content. So we're seeing all of that just ramping up a lot during the election year. Now, as the new Congress gets sworn in in January, we're going to have to see how that translates into actual legislation, proposals, and also because, as we all agree, the Supreme Court is extremely politicized right now. Um, some of the cases that concern online content are making their way up through the appellate courts towards the Supreme Court. And and so this has been a year where a lot of the rhetoric around the things that we're interested in has been ramped up, but we will see the results of this in the next year. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be interesting to look at it because there, there has been an ebb and flow where the rhetoric goes gets really heightened during election years. And then when you look at the following year, things tend to quiet down. And then, again, you get an election year the following year, so they get ramped up again. Um, I don't know if we are able to predict how much that will translate into actual legislation or, or actual court decisions, but there has been definitely a ramping up of the conversation about what the right considers pornography and desires to eradicate it, which never bodes well for the industry. Yeah. So what does the right, like, how do you, that, I guess that's, this has been a question that has been raised time and time again, like what is pornography? What is obscene? Because that can be, that can vary from person to person. So what does the right consider pornography? Well, this is why it's like, similar. Does Playboy fall into that category? <clears throat> Uh, and Cozy has uh, stated in the past that uh, Sports Illustrated and Cosmopolitan are hardcore pornography. I mean, they're a religious group. They used to be morality in media, and they they do think any kind of expression of sexuality, like we're like what we're seeing in libraries across the country right now. You know, uh, material that contains discussions of sexuality that is aimed at teenagers is now being called pornography because it's in libraries where teenagers can see it. So we're uh, also blurring the distinction between a child and a minor. Um, the problem with pornography and the definition of pornography, much like Roe v. Wade, is that it's based on a series of court decisions that are very, very finely worded and can be interpreted in different ways. And the people who want to ban pornography are very, very aware of this. Much like the people who wanted to ban abortion knew exactly how to go uh, after the Roe v. Wade decision. Mm -hmm. um, it all hinges on a word called prurient. So just 
as a refresher, um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard this. Um, there's a definition between obscenity and pornography, and obscenity is not protected by the First Amendment. Uh, but sexual material that is not obscene is protected by the First Amendment. Now, how do you decide what is and isn't obscene? Where, well, the word that they used was the prurient interest of people. That appeals to the prurient interest, so has been made with prurient interest. Prurient has been defined as something that awakens low or negative or, or bad emotions in people. Which, I guess, Again. sexual emotions are considered low, bad. Is that... Well, but the argument for First Amendment that was made is that when people make a work of art or they make something, they're not making it with a low or bad or, 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 or negative or harmful connotation. So pornographers and other people who make any kind of content that contains sexual material made the argument a long time ago that, that the content is not obscene, mm -hmm. that it's for adults, but it's not obscene. Uh, so it has all hinged on how you define that word prurient. And then there is another element of that, of the three-pronged test. It's called the Miller test from the 1973 Mil Miller versus California decision. And then one of the other elements is that it has, well, the three elements, well, pruriency, uh, the, it, it's um, the, the community standards, the standards of the community, which is almost impossible to prove right now because the internet is everywhere. So which community yeah. standards do you right. use? Which is a problem that Twitter and Facebook and Instagram are running into right now because they're international companies. So which community standards should they use? Right. They're running into the same problem that people were running into when these decisions were made. The third one is that you can't consider parts of the work you have to consider the work as a whole. Mm -hmm. That one is not that great to defend porn because porn is porn. It's the work as a whole. That one is more for people who wanted to ban a book that had one chapter that was about sex. Mm -hmm. So taken as a whole, the chapter about sex could be considered sexual or pornographic, but the work itself was not pornographic. That third part of the argument is actually not that useful for pornography because pornography is mostly if you take it as a whole is about sexuality right right okay what um so what do you think we have to look forward to in 2023 do you think so do you think that a lot of this legislation oh so let me sorry let me rephrase this what legislation specifically are we looking at challenging us well Right now, the attacks are coming from different directions, and they're they're all being coordinated in a very, uh, very substantial way by Encosi, and in a lesser way by Exodus Cry. These are groups; these are religious groups that that got a big injection of capital uh, through their actions against Pornhub and MindGeek over the last two years. Their their financials just just blew up, mm -hmm. and so and they have a very strong, particularly and cause a very strong legal arms that are like trying to place lawsuits at different venues so that it can go up the appeals ladder and eventually get to the Supreme Court and get some decisions. But what you have right now is uh, the attacks have not been there there hasn't been any attempt in the law to revive widespread obscenity prosecutions mm -hmm. however there was just a conviction somebody uh, pleaded guilty on fosta sesta for trying to run a knockoff of backpage.com and it, it is a fosta sesta uh, um, conviction so it's the first high profile one mm -hmm. uh, so that one could open the door to some of the obscenity stuff. I mean, as you know, and we've, we've spoken about this in the past, reviving obscenity prosecutions is perhaps the, the biggest danger. And it's probably the longest shot for them, although that's what J.D. Vance and Josh Howley and people like that have been, have been saying, or, uh, Rick Scott from Florida too. A lot of people in the Republican uh, uh, ecosystem are, are pushing for reviving obscenity prosecutions. Um, the other ways to come after pornography, uh, particularly online, have to do with um, 
trying to sue or create liability for platforms uh, when they're hosting sexual material. Are we talking about Section 230 right now? And that section, they can, the platforms can appeal to Section 230, which says that they're not liable for things other people upload. But there are several cases that are going through right now uh, through the courts that could have an impact if some of the courts decide that indeed they have liability for this. And th these have to do with things where uh, people were either minors or coerced and their videos were uploaded by third parties online and then they ended up on one of the platforms. And so and COSI is pushing a lot of these lawsuits just to get one judge to agree that the platforms are indeed liable for this. Uh, in that case, if liability starts creeping up on the platforms, they might make the decision Twitter and Reddit, which were the two that were allowing sexual content openly, mm -hmm. uh, they might push for uh, banning all sexual content, which is the approach that Apple and Facebook took very early on which then translated to Instagram when Facebook bought Instagram. Uh, it's called the, 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 female, the female nipple bar, right? Mm -hmm. Anything above f one female ni nipple. Female appearing nipple, I don't know. They use some kind of weird phrase. But yeah, anything from the nipples beyond is you can't have it on the platform. But isn't that kind of untrue? Because we've seen so many samples of other mainstream companies or even companies like playboy uploading stuff where you can clearly see a female nipple and they're not they don't have their content taken down whereas sex workers would do much less and they definitely have their content taken down is that because the idea is that oh well this is art versus pornography is that the distinction that the platforms make no, I don't think that's a distinction that this, they make. Uh, outright nipples are extremely rare. I've seen maybe one of a couple of celebrities or like maybe they post a magazine cover from Europe. Uh, very, very, very rarely you see a female nipple there. The general blur them. Uh, but yes, you see. And, and there is definitely a double standard where those things are not removed and things that sex workers post are removed. Uh, I don't think that they're making any, uh, first of all, they won't comment on that. Facebook, Meta, uh, Instagram, they will never comment on that, uh, even though they've been challenged explicitly and, and they haven't. Um, it probably has to do with something that has become very obvious, which is that companies that have a, a relationship with Meta and Playboy have a different channel to handle things mm -hmm. uh, than sex workers and other users who don't have that channel. So probably what is happening is that the sex workers are getting, you know, either moralistic people or trolls or malicious people just, uh, you know, telling on them through the system. They're like reporting those, those pictures. And then it goes through the regular channel. But if you try to do that on Playboy or a celebrity or, or anything like that, then within meta it doesn't go through the same channel it probably goes to a channel where it's handled by people who handle their accounts right right okay and therefore they probably are like oh well it's just this person's but we'll we'll let it slide right you mentioned uh fosta sesta and i know that we've discussed this at length before in previous interviews um but there is a question here from one of my patreon members from hugo and just maybe a quick recap for people who aren't familiar with FOSTA SESTA. Uh, Hugo asks, what do you think about FOSTA SESTA and what can non-industry people do better to help sex workers? Well, FOSTA SESTA, I mean, what I think is that it's a piece of legislation that was developed by um, religious Republican legislators in the Midwest and somehow they got Democrats to sign up for it to particularly Kamala Harris, the current vice president, uh, who kind of staked her career on her support support for FOSTA SESTA. And and it was written in with a rhetoric that they were going to dismantle the brothel online and protect the traffic people and so forth. And and the law did no such thing. It's just a carve out of Section 230 saying that if the content deals with something 
that could be construed as trafficking, then Section 230 uh, protections don't apply. Um, shortly after it passed, shortly before it passed, actually, uh, um, Backpage.com was taken down. Um, it was a, a huge political moral campaign to write a law that really did not do anything of what they say they were doing. And it was the most important thing why I think it's n not a good piece of legislation is because it, as a lot of things that had to do with sex work, it was put together by people who think sex work shouldn't exist and without any meaningful consultation with any of the groups or, or members or people who are actual sex workers or people who are in the world of sex work advocacy, which are men. Um, so it was essentially an abolitionist uh, uh, law that endangered the life of sex workers, did not look at any of the evidence, and then politicians just run behind it just because he had the word trafficking in it. And uh, the mainstream media either supported it or did not platform the people who would have criticized this. So it's it's a really bad law and uh, it can be used, that carve out can be used to carve out a lot of other things on Section 230 to the point where the fear of liability would become, uh, will have a chilling effect on, on free speech. Mm -hmm. That's a big problem. What was the other part of the question? I um, what can non-industry people do to better help sex workers? I mean, vote. talk. I mean, <laughs> vote. Sure, but talk talk about things. Like point out the things. Uh, make sure that that the make sure that they listen to sex workers. That they read what they write. There's plenty of people who are great writers and uh, have a lot to say about this. Follow them on social media. Uh, get involved in conversations and just keep pointing out that. You know, we all want to protect the children. We all want uh, uh, all the online space to be more positive. We all want these things, but we should not let those causes be hijacked by people whose interest is actually to uh, eradicate all sexual expression because they think that they think that there is holy sex that only happens under certain circumstances. Uh, uh, you know between married cis people and then everything else is something forbidden, taboo, dirty, uh, should be out, should not be part of the public discourse. That is their motivation. They're, they're religiously motivated for this. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're hijacking uh, the, the anti-trafficking cause, which is a very good cause that, you know, people should be doing much more about it. There's tons of funds that should be going for that that are being diverted into ridiculous campaigns to harass consensual sex workers or, or harass, you know, adult industry people. Um, so I think that what people who are not in the industry can do is just continue participating in the conversation and, and, and you know, giving examples to the people who are being maybe swayed and convinced by uh, the pro-censorship groups that that's not the case, that they should go back and listen to what the actual sex workers are saying. Yeah, I mean, the whole sex trafficking, um, I mean, just that word alone is just like anybody who's anti-porn. It's just their favorite word because everyone can get behind anti-sex trafficking, right? Like nobody wants anybody to be forced into sex work. Um, but it just seems that they don't, speak to like why do you think that the sex workers who are actually outspoken about enjoying their job about it being a consensual choice for them why do you think that they're so ignored and do you think that there maybe is some kind of misogyny in the idea that you know the religious right and anybody who's anti-porn seems to take the idea that any woman involved in sex work must have been trafficked into it um, rather than had made that choice on her own. I mean, you brought up a lot of good points there. And in that one question, there's a lot of elements that are not talked about uh, enough, I, I, I feel. Um, one of them is like, rightly, you mentioned that they focus on women, on cis women, yeah. usually white cis women. That, that is their focus. That's what the pictures that they put up. That's the speakers that they foster. Uh, um the stories that they tell when they're giving this. 
ignoring the fact that you know there's tons of sex workers who are men there are tons of sex, work, sex workers that are trans people uh, and there is a lot of sex workers that are people of color and 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 the experience is very varied but they focus on this kind of ideal victim because they need a victim they need they need to victimize the other thing which is interesting to me too is and and i've read some people have spoken up and saying hey be careful too you just said the the people who enjoy this job the enjoyment of the job should not be part of the defense of this people are doing things because they're trying to make a living and i think that there is a way in which the anti-porn people who are religiously inspired and they want censorship those are the two things that they can't say outright so they're hiding it behind other things they've hijacked uh very valid labor grievances that sex workers may have to justify the point that this is somehow like slavery like some of the things that they accuse the adult industry of doing is just jobs it's jobs in america you know workers in america don't have a lot of protections and and they're more and more endangered uh, uh, by whatever system they're being part of when they work in their jobs. And 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 but the people who want to ban porn are latching on to some of those things. So I think it's it's interesting. I've heard some sex workers saying, "Well, they're forcing me to defend the system that is actually exploiting me in a way, but they're tr- trying to make me attack it." for the things that I actually would agree with them that need to be changed in the system, but they're doing it for all the wrong reasons. And that's the core of it is that the anti-porn groups in the war on porn are deceitful. They are, they're, they're disingenuous. They're, they're lying. They're not saying we think there is a, you know, man in the sky or a spiritual force that only blesses one kind of sex. And then everything else must be, not talked about and must be taken out. No, they don't want to say that. They used to say that when they were called morality in media and they had people with like priest scholars and so forth. That's how they fronted. Well, since Don Hawkins came in, who is this Mormon Republican operative that came in to help them rebrand for the 21st century, now it's all about anti trafficking and this and that. And yeah. But yeah, I mean, there is an element. I don't know. It is misogynistic that in a kind of very roundabout way, but the core of it is that they're looking for a perfect victim and that the people like Nick Kristoff and people in the media would latch onto that and just like belabor this, like, oh, look, the poor exploited person. You brought up such an interesting point that I haven't really thought about too much, but the fact that, you know, if sex work is work, right, if we define it as work, which most people don't, they think it's just exploitation, they think it's just slavery, then we should be able to look at the pr- labor practices that need to be addressed or changed. So if a sex worker comes out and says, you know, I would really like to be paid more, I, or I would like royalties on my work, or I would like to work in an environment where I have access to this and this and healthcare, I don't know, whatnot. Um, the general, you know, anti-porn movement takes that as, see, they're being enslaved because they're complaining about these things that are really like, no, I, I, I enjoy sex work. I want to do this job, but I would like these specific things to change because it's work. And, you know, I think that these are things that we as workers should receive. But, but it's not like they want to eradicate sex work in general, but it seems to be that they latch onto those and use that to attack the industry as a whole. It's like you can't say, oh, let's change these little things or let's get rid of these predatory people. We saw that as well. And then the media was like, predators in the adult industry, everybody's like that, get out, destroy the industry. It's like, no, let's, let's clean it up. Let's make this a better place. Let's look at it as a legitimate job and let's make work better for the people in it well yeah but that's i mean that's the reason way back in the day when i started covering the industry one of the things that i was telling my editors at the time uh was that i wanted to cover a lot of aspects of it the same way that we would cover other branch of entertainment and 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 you know 
making pornography has a lot in common and a lot of overlap, actually, in terms of uh, locations and staff and, and crews with mainstream filmmaking in Los Angeles. And it has a lot of overlap with the uh, modeling industry, with the fashion modeling industry. There's a, there's a lot of issues that are similar in those things. But you don't see anybody coming in and say, let's, let's shut down Hollywood or let's shut down the yeah. modeling industry. Although, you know, there's been some noise being made. Uh, there's been some coverage of the Victoria's Secret owner uh, and the Victoria's Secret fashion show. There's been some revision of what that did to models and modeling agencies. But nobody's coming down and saying, let's just not have models anymore, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which shows you that the the war on porn is driven by people who actually want they want censorship for religious reasons that is the fact and that is the those are the two things that they have decided to put behind the curtain and and pretend that they're anything like that but if you're looking at how they attack the labor practices in adult it has a lot what they're talking about has a lot in common with other things the thing is that back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s when Hollywood got unionized, uh, that was a time for unionization worldwide. You know, it was it was a time where collective bargaining was was a thing that was happening. It was a movement. Uh, we're living in a different time now, and and a lot of those protections for for collective bargaining and unions and things like that are not have not been doing that great since the 1980s in America. You know, hmm. uh, so the fact that the adult industry did not become a legitimate industry until the early 1990s or the very late 1980s, that was way past the period where, where the idea of a union or collective bargaining was part of the cultural conversation and it was, it was a viable force. It's from an earlier era. So Hollywood actors should be thankful that they got unionized when they did, even though SAG has gone through a lot of mutations, you know, and yeah the fact that they could collectively bargain at some point um, was something that by the time that the adult industry became a viable industry in the 90s after the court decisions that made pornography actually legal and you could get a paycheck and you could you know pay taxes etc uh, that was not a good time for unions in america yeah there's been a lot of questions around unionization people have asked like why doesn't the adult industry unionize? There's been people in the industry who've been trying to um, push forward unionization, but there's been a lot of people who've been against it. What do you think are the negative drawbacks to, why do you think that the adult industry overall is just not able to unionize? Well, I mean, I mean, there, there are efforts. There's APAG, APAG uh, uh, which is led by Alana Evans, uh, uh, does a lot of, you know, Alana has been very good at um, building the infrastructure of a union and filing the things that need to be filed. And, you know, she does a fair bit of activism, but uh, it's a big effort to get, you, you have to get a critical mass of people and a critical mass of, you know, active talent that is doing really well right now. Again, we're at a time where quarreling that, creating a critical mass of that, is very difficult. And also... Do you think a lot of it has to do with it, especially now, because most people are able to be independent, and independent creators? I mean, since the launch of OnlyFans and so many performers are doing well on their own and not even working for studios anymore. Yeah, but even in the past, like, I, I, I frankly don't know if Hollywood didn't have a union from the 30s, from the you know 20s 30s 40s i don't know if you could unionize hollywood actors right now mm -hmm. um, um people have a different mentality and that you that brings up another point that that i always think is interesting which is that because it deals with sexuality uh people think that the adult industry is quote unquote progressive because there is a perception particularly in america that the things that have to do with sexuality are progressive and not conservative Mm -hmm. um, well, it just so happened that the adult industry is made up of a whole bunch of, you know, entrepreneurs and people who want to start companies and particularly the companies, but also a lot of the performers. And when you have people who are, you know, small business people, they do tend to lean right. 
and a lot of people in the industry do tend to lean right. And that has created a lot of problems because in, in America, the right is represented by the Republican Party. But the Republican Party is an alliance between people who like what the right has to say about economic matters and the people who like are really pushing for social conservatism and and those people are very much anti-porn mm -hmm. and so you find a lot of people you know there's a lot of self-defined liberal uh, sorry sorry self-defined libertarians and uh there's a lot of people who like keep quiet but the industry is made up of of a lot of people who lean right and that they always find themselves in this like weird situation caught in the middle because the political representatives that that push those kind of ideas that they believe economically are also trying to shut down their entire business yeah it's a little complicated <laughs> and, and that is not good and and so you know by which i'm saying that a lot of these people who would be in this union actually you know the performers themselves sometimes these are people who lean right and don't like unions and they see themselves more as like small business people mm -hmm. that that want to you know they they don't like unions and they don't like state state intervention um it gets complicated yeah and uh, i always like to say that sex and the, the depiction of sex uh, is something that really messes up any kind of definition of right and left mm -hmm. yeah all right guys we're going to take a quick commercial break and when we come back we're going to talk about so much more um i have some questions about um visa and mastercard and their new regulations where are we going with that and so much more so hang tight we'll be right back with all the bad news about prices these days it's nice to know that adam and eve is still offering the best deal out there adam and eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy it's got toys games movies and so much more whether you're single and looking to impress a new partner or you're in a relationship and you need to spice up your sex life, Adam and Eve has what you need. They've been at the top of the adult retail chain for decades, and there's a reason for that. Now my listeners will get 50% off of any one item, and that's not all. You also get three bonus sexy items and six movies for free, plus free shipping. No matter what you choose from the privacy of your own home, you can rest assured that it will be shipped to you in discreet packaging. So go to adamandeve.com, select any one item at 50% off, plus enjoy three sexy gifts and free shipping with the code HOLLY. That's adamandeve.com and use code HOLLY. You have to use my code in order to get this special deal. Hey guys, we are back. So I want to start off um, by asking you a question from one of my Patreon members, Dave. Uh, Dave says, first of all, I want to say that you are a terrific journalist. Oh, we are lucky to have a person like you reporting on this business. My question is this. When the OnlyFans first announced that they would prohibit adult content, I heard a lot of people blame MasterCard for it. MasterCard was vilified for placing unfair rules on the type of content they would allow on websites they did business with. Then OnlyFans reversed their policy and everyone stopped blaming MasterCard. But MasterCard never changed their policy towards adult sites as far as I know. So was MasterCard really the villain here or were people looking for a scapegoat and is the industry at stake too? So that situation got a little complicated, but, and, and it will be, it is, I, I've written extensively about it. I'll send you to xbase.com and, and, you know, just look up MasterCard on the on the search. And yeah. also we went into this in detail, I think the last time you yeah. were on, right? Yeah. So you can go back to one of my previous podcasts with Gustavo. Um, it was actually a live show that we did and we talked very much in detail about this whole thing, but go ahead. Yeah, so uh, t I'm trying to think how to put it in a, in a, in a kind of simpler way. The, the original MasterCard change of rules had to do with uh, the attack on uh, Pornhub and MindGeek that Nick Kristoff did in at the end of 2020. Uh, uh, the article that Kristoff wrote was written by this investor guy named Bill Ackman, who is somebody very controversial in the investing community, not, not because of this, but because of a ton of other reasons. You should Google Bill Ackman, and uh, he's, he's considered a very kind of strange, controversial, loose kind of type guy. Uh, but he picked up the phone and called one of the 
higher ups on MasterCard, and, and MasterCard changed their policies based on that. So it was a direct line between this article, that platform, the notions of Lila Micklewhite from Exodus Cry, uh, uh, it, it really it did in a sensationalist kind of gross way, just objectifying the, the victims, just typical Nick Christoph stuff. Um, and so Ackman got involved in that. Then much later, OnlyFans was just looking for investments. And uh, OnlyFans was, is, and was, a, 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 I always say, it's a bank. It's a, it's a payment processing operation. Uh, they're not a web company. They're not a, a, a. They don't offer anything particularly novel in terms of the platform. You can't even search things. They don't have previews. OnlyFans is just like a black box where people put their credit card information, and uh, they process that payment and then they pay it out to the to the uh, uh, people who put in the content. Um, they offered a very good deal. They took out less money than other platforms, and so they succeeded. And the reason why they could do that is because they had better deals in the financial sector that allowed them to process uh, that taking 20% instead of 40% or whatever. Um, and so they got critical mass and they got a network effect and they became very famous. Um, but they, when they started looking for investments, they realized that a lot of the, a lot of the pushback that had been happening in the financial sector was affecting them. And this has a lot to do also how the payment processing in the, is done. Which again, go and look up what I mentioned before. But it has to do with like chains of banks and authorizations and the credit card companies. It's it's a very convoluted cloud of things. Uh, that resulted in them making a risk assessment decision of saying, well, this might be too risky for us to grow to the level we want to grow. And then when they got the pushback, they pull back and now they're trying, you know, they put a different person as a CEO who used to be their, their PR person now is the CEO. And then there is a PR person too in there. And they're, they're now playing a very kind of balanced game where they are trying not to piss off the sex worker contingent that built their brand, but also they're not embracing them. And they're kind of playing in much more of a, a, a kind of balanced game, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, comes with, the, 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 it opens them up from criticisms from both sides. But that, that's the game that they're playing after that big thing that they did in a way that caused a lot of pushback. Yeah. So. Uh, so this Bill Ackman character, uh, then uh, in August of this year, he he went to he went on on TV show and started he went with Lila Mikkelwa from Exodus Cry, both of them, and started screaming about uh, a different lawsuit that targeted Visa. So what what happened was that one of these lawsuits that they're trying to put up the chain so that they can get a Supreme Court decision uh, banning porn or whatever uh, uh they targeted MindGeek, and then they also named as a defendant they named a visa because they said MindGeek process through visa now for for the videos that in question for that case MindGeek also was processing mastercard at the time but they left mastercard out because mastercard folded when bill Ackman told them to in 2020 but visa hadn't so uh, the lawsuit went through with Visa as a defendant, and Visa went to the to the judge and said, "Look, we can you take us out of this lawsuit? We have nothing to do with this. We were just like the credit card company. We have no idea what MindGeek had in the content. We had no idea what the users were putting up in the content. We're just process payments." And there was one judge in California that said, "No, no, no. The the the, the lawsuit can move forward, and you can be a, a, a defendant in it. So we're we're going to allow the lawsuit to move forward." So a couple of days later. Bill Ackman goes on TV with the woman from Exodus Cry, with Lila Micklewhite, who started the whole thing by feeding all that stuff to Nick Kristoff, and started say just just challenging by name the the the, the CEO of, of Visa and, and trying to shame them, and Visa ended up changing the rules. They 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 saw this as a bad PR opportunity, and which is. Unfortunate and 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 unusual too, because 
the actually the argument they made in front of the judge was that they are not liable and by acknowledging what Ackman was doing and changing the rules, they're sort of undermining their own case. They're mm -hmm. sort of claiming that maybe they did have something to do with it, but the pressure that he put on them was too much. Yeah. I mean, do you think that Visa and MasterCard would ever get to a place where they felt so pressured by um, cases like this that they would stop processing payments for anything adult related? Well, here's the problem. You always are falling down. This is this is why I mentioned before that Apple, Apple and Facebook a long time ago made that lowest common sexual denominator, the nipple policy. So anything anything beyond showing a woman's nipple is porn essentially for them. It's adult, uh, and then they have to come up with these like weird. They do have like a weird disclaimer now that it's like, well, if it's breast cancer or breastfeeding or the, it's it's just weird, then you may put it there. There's a very odd carve outs that they have to do because not even that can be the lower bar. Because mm -hmm. once you start pushing the bar, where do you put it? Yeah, I always said I had an I had a meeting with some people very high up on on back then it was called Facebook. It's Meta now, and they did tell me uh, that. You know, well, we're we're active in a lot of places, uh, so we 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 can't have the morality of of California, and they mentioned Saudi Arabia, like like wow, well, we're in Saudi Arabia. I'm like, well, but then should California then have the morality of Saudi Arabia? Like, where do you put the lowest common denominator of what that is? Yeah, and that's the problem that Visa and Mastercard are going to run into. Yeah, like, can you show Michelangelo's David? There is a penis in there. Can you can you? Is the problem that the the people who are banning books in libraries right now? Uh, do do we ban the the Bible? The Bible has tons of like bizarre, messed up sex stuff in it. Mm -hmm. Should we should we then should, should be the cut off any mention of sex? That's why they that's why the Supreme Court in 1973 came up with the three point rule, saying that it has to be the majority, the the work as a whole, the community standards, and then the prurient interest. Right. But, well. That's being revised right now by a lot of people. And that that could turn into something dangerous. And then you have somebody like, for example, you have like what, what's happening right now with Elon Musk. We're recording this, you know, two weeks, three weeks after he purchased Twitter. And the way he's been tweeting about content moderation shows that any of the like fine-tuned debates about content moderation that have happened over the last 30 years, he knows nothing about them. It's just some rich dude who bought a new toy and he's spewing stuff that everybody's rolling their eyes who's in this sector, in the content moderation sector, because it's like, yeah, he's just talking like a five-year-old child that, that has not been through like 40 years of trying to figure out how not to destroy free speech, break things, not allow people to communicate about sexuality in any way, endanger LGBTQ people. Like these are all issues that have been covered in the debate of what do we do about the depiction of sexuality online. Mm -hmm. And then he's coming in and he just wants us to relitigate re everything based on these like odd notions, which will lead to censorship at some point. If he continues down some of these paths, they will directly lead, lead him to censorship, which is something that people have pointed out now and again. And so that is the problem with Visa Mastercard. Once you start putting the bar, like we're not going to cover this. Well, where do you where do you actually put it? Mm -hmm. One solution for them, and one solution that the people in favor of censorship might accept, is what is called the the red light district solution. Just create an area that is adult. Which I'm online. Yeah. So there is a fenced area where everything that is adult goes in. Red light district solutions don't work either because you're just separating sexuality from, which is one and, of the main facts of life, from life. You're, yeah, and then like how do you determine like what needs to go in that space? And what does that even mean? That there's some kind of gateway that you have to verify your age and then you France, go... I mean, the, the minister, one of the ministers of, I don't know if culture or technology, one of the ministers of government in france she just said let's just have a credit card people have to put in their credit card and there might be a one euro charge or no charge but they had to put the credit card to go into the 
pornographic website. Well, okay. And she said, this is not the best solution, but it's the only one we have. Mm -hmm. That's what she said. Yeah. Children don't have credit cards, so therefore, if you have a credit card, you can go in. Well, that opens a whole kind of worms in terms of free speech and how you connect and privacy. Mm -hmm. So now your porn consumption is going to be connected to... Yeah, there's a lot of people who are afraid to put down a credit card because they don't want their name attached to anything pornographic. And there's also like people who believe that, you know, if they sign up, I mean, I've had emails from several people who are like, oh, I'd sign up for your website or this website. But I but I know that like if I do that, I'll get all of these like viruses, like literally the porn sites themselves are dirty and will infect your computer with viruses that like we just have like these viruses that are just like sitting on our site the minute like you log in we're just gonna like infect your computer it's so bizarre yeah 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 they they and it's also a circular argument because you know this is the same that happens with the with the retail stores it's called it's a circular argument they call it secondary harms the doctrine of secondary harms so they say uh you can't put a sex shop downtown you had to you you zone the city so that you cannot put those places there so the sex store opens in the outskirts of the town which is dangerous and so they're like oh see there is all this crime happening there so that's the reason you can't put the sex shop downtown i'm like no we put it there in the first place because you wouldn't let us put it there yeah but look now it correlates to crime so it's the same thing because you put it in a place that was already had crime issues. Yeah. And so the crime issues just continued yeah. in a place that you would only allow a sex Correct. shop to exist. Correct. Yeah. As, I, and it's the same thing with like, oh, I don't want to go, I don't want to go to this domain name that is registered in like Cyprus because that could be dangerous. Well, can we register the domain name here in Los Angeles? No, it's a sex site. So yeah, it's the same argument that you're, you're seeing a reenactment in the digital world of the discrimination that sex oriented businesses face in the in the in the real world yeah i have a question for you about like media literacy and porn because one thing that i have come across a lot and that i have thought about more you know being being kind of a new mother is that okay we don't want children to be able to access porn right i think everybody for the most part agrees at that but there doesn't seem to be any kind of education or information out there about how a parent could do that. Like there are programs that you supposedly can't use like net nanny and stuff like that install on your child's computer or phone that would prevent them from accessing these sites or even some kind of software where you can see like what your child's looking at or even God forbid, perhaps we create some kind of education around pornography online you know, if your kids access it, um, some way to talk to them about what they're seeing and giving it some context. How do you feel about that? Because it just seems that everybody wants to just stick their head in the stand and, you know, they think either their child is, is not accessing porn, there's no way, or we just need to eradicate porn and that's going to solve the problem. Well, the rhetoric, I mean, we, we're seeing this across the board politically in America that the rhetoric about every issue has become more polarized. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's a function of the way that the internet processes information and sends information at such speed and based on, uh, you know, uh, what they call algorithmic, but it's in fact, you know, choices and preferences that, that they tend to polarize people. This is, this is an effect of that. So you're right that people are not, they're not looking at practical solutions. Even though I disagree with the credit card uh, uh, solution that the French minister put in, I, I, I think it's interesting that she, I, I think it's positive and interesting that she said, well, look, this is not the perfect solution, but we had to do something. So let's do this. I, I, I think there should be much more of that uh, in terms of uh, addressing how people consume media in general and particularly how they consume sexualized media uh well 
let's come up with solutions that address things in a way where we don't go polarized, saying eradicate everything or you know do this, do that. Um, unfortunately, I don't see a lot in at the rhetorical level, at the level that people are talking about things. There isn't anything that to me makes sense. For example. There is no serious debate about sex education. Now it's become this like insane thing where like in deep red parts of the country, they're talking about banning books and banning any kind of mention of sexuality. And they're coming in through the side, they're coming in through a very, very deep homophobic side. Very, very, th these are clearly homophobic and transphobic uh, um, um, positions. Uh, but, you know, it affects in general how you address sexuality and how you... The, the, the debate about sex education in America is, I mean, light years behind other, other uh, you know, strong economies, other countries, uh, European countries, so forth. Um, I don't see it happening anytime soon. And then the other thing that you're pointing out, like, those are filters. And the porn filter debate has, again, been completely co-opted by the anti-porn religious people. So they have these for-profit uh, porn filters that are actually censorship surveillance devices. There was a great article uh, uh, on Wired not that long ago showing that this guy was just looking up the word gay or something and, and his minister called him and says, why, why have you been looking at the word gay? Like the software was sending his information to his minister who then his accountability body or so wait, hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. So did he sign up? Did he put this filter on his computer willingly and gave his minister access to it because he wanted to be accountable because he had a he thought he had a problem with porn? He wasn't well, the churches were encouraging people to put their software in there and he might not have been told exactly what would happen afterwards. Right. But okay. but yeah, the churches were like encouraging this. And in several states, starting with Utah, Utah is always ground zero for all the anti-porn activity. Uh, uh, they are pushing to have those filters put by default on every device uh, yeah. sold or operating in the state, which would be very profitable for uh, the companies doing the filters, mm -hmm. the main of which is called Covenant Eyes. They have massive campaigns on Facebook uh, advertising. Like, in fact, if you type anything to do with porn, I'm a porn journalist, so I do type sometimes things with porn on Facebook. I don't use it that much, but occasionally I put an article of mine. I get bombarded with eyes for, uh, ads for Covenant Eyes. And Covenant Eyes is just this religious group that started a porn filter, and now their CEO is the head of the board of Encosi. Yeah. So... You have Encozy lobbying to put these filters on the phones, and then you have Covenant Eyes um, um, profiting from it. Now, oddly enough, people ask me, well, but if they succeed on their ultimate goal, which is the eradication of porn, then you wouldn't need the filter, right? <laughs> uh, they're going at all. I mean, it's such a moneymaker for, yeah. for the conservatives just to attack porn, however it is that they define it, that they just... They don't care if there is no logical. It's so it's interesting that you say that because I've heard from so many people on my YouTube channel specifically that these anti porn ads will come up on my channel yeah. that YouTube approves and puts through Google AdSense that I have absolutely zero control over that the ads that they put on my videos. Yeah. But so often, so people will watch something I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it happens on this video. Here we are talking about like free speech, yeah. you know, sex worker rights. And then, you know, boom, oh, this ad lies. will pop up for like, are you addicted to porn? Pay all this money for like an anti-masturbation course. Yeah. But but funnily enough, pornography and and uh, the anti they, they appear side by side in culture. They appear in the 18th century at the same time commercial pornography and the commercial uh, anti-masturbation industry mm -hmm. are both products of the of the you know capitalist revolution because yeah. you know people have been jacking off since the beginning of time since we were animals but yeah. then uh, at some point people are like how can we charge people for this 
And one side said, well, we're going to give them pictures to look at while they do it. And the other side is, we're going to sell them remedies so that they don't want to do it. And both industries have the parallel development. And ironically, we're in the middle of No Not November right now. No Not November. Where, yeah. which, where did that come from? It's the same rehashed ideas. Like, it's the same ideas. It's, this has to do with Victorian ideas that took up a medieval idea, which is that the semen is a life force. And if you lose the semen, you lose the life force. And there is a correlation between men ejaculating and men not being... Uh, uh, energize in some way and it just popped up again with the internet and reddit and and these groups but isn't it kind of the opposite because from what i understand scientific studies have shown that it's actually healthy for men to release sperm on a regular basis and in fact it can be an effective tool against prostate cancer yeah i mean there's yeah but it, it, it's a disorder like thinking that you have control over something it is connected to anorexia in a way it's a it's 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 a similar kind of like mental disorder thinking that if you control things mm -hmm. then that will have an effect in who you are and how you're perceived and all this stuff so with anorexia the idea of anorexia promises to these people who fall into it and and, and feel that if they control their food obsessively then their life is going to take this course it's the same thing with like these guys who are like think well if i can control the way i jack off or don't jack off then you know yeah my life is just going to be completely different well yeah. it's not your life is probably determined by a lot of other things not by how much you jack off yeah it kind of reminds me of those instagram um memes that i see like mindset therapy and stuff and it's like do these five things and yeah. you will become super rich um i think like one of them is like don't watch porn and look like Porn can be a time waster and people can definitely obsessively watch porn yeah, in a yeah, way yeah. that isn't healthy. They can also obsessively watch Netflix. Correct. In a way that isn't healthy and Video just games. consume media. I Video think, games. I think, yeah, I think overall just the consumption of media is more of an issue um, itself than like porn specifically. Unless, of course, you're watching tons of episodes of Holly Randall Unfiltered, then it's very, very healthy for you. <laughs> Well, I mean, the difference—the <coughs> difference is the difference between compulsive behavior and an addiction. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's compulsive behavior attached to it, and of course, you know, um, some pornography is even um, very little of it actually, but some of it is optimized for people, like the little ads that they place on porn sites. There, there are people who are like studying, oh, how much. How many seconds of this boob jiggling thing we have to show for people to watch two seconds more? There is some kind of like analysis, like fine analysis of stuff like that. But in general, I mean, you produce porn. Like it's not that porn is not made to be addictive. Porn is made to for people to watch more of what they already enjoy. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's not... It, video games in that sense you know i don't know if you've ever played those phone games where you had to match three things and like I, uh, yeah, yeah i don't but some, i know about that yeah yeah it's like people can waste hours on that because those are or social media twitter checking uh, instagram likes and things uh, that kind of compulsivity is way more compulsive than porn mm -hmm. there is nothing nothing to the to the horrendous theory that they're pushing uh, that porn is like cocaine in the brain and like deforms your brain and all these kind of like bullshit neuroscience adjacent stuff that they're peddling is complete nonsense uh, yes we have a big problem with compulsivity in this society because very very powerful you know wealthy organizations have figured out ways for us to continue engaging with them and continue giving them money Again, like I was saying before about the unionization and, and, and Hollywood in general, yes, we have a problem like that in society with all forms of entertainment, and porn also is part of that. But porn is nowhere near what something like a video game yeah. would do to a person in terms of hours spent in an environment, like giving money to that environment. I mean, you even have like these ads for these phone games that say like in a positive game, like, oh my God, this game is so addicting. Yeah. yeah. You know, and they like push that, like this game is addicting, download it so you can be addicted to and like waste your life staring at your phone. Yeah. Yeah. 
and always, you know, the 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 gaming industry always has tried to join the two things. Like, there's always like a porn component mm -hmm. to the gaming industry. You remember Leisure Suit Larry? Oh my yeah. god! Oh my god! Yes. Okay, Leisure Suit Larry. This is so funny that you brought this up. So this was a game that I used to try to play when I was a kid. My parents like knew I had the game, didn't give a shit. But I remember that in order to verify you were over the age of 18, the game made you take this bizarre quiz that supposedly like adults would have the answer to, like who's in Ulysses S. Grant's tomb yeah. and stuff like that, like bizarre like questions about American history and stuff. And you had to answer all of these questions and in like a certain time frame, um, and that would verify that you were over 18 and you could play the game. And I remember going to my parents with these questions because I wanted to play the game and they didn't give a shit. Um, but they being from Europe and South Africa respectively, like didn't know the answers to a lot of these questions. And so I used to have the, I used to make notes. If I would get a question right, I'd write it down. And so I had all these post-it notes. And so when I tried to take the quiz, I'd like have them all out and try to figure it out. So I could, I mean, it would take me forever to like, and that was the age verification it was so bizarre. Well, maybe they should suggest that to the minister of France. <laughs> they should have instead of a credit card, they should have like, you know, a quiz that like yeah. proves that. But was you know, the of lead course, singer of Duran Duran. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, right. But of course, like back then, you know, we didn't have the internet, so you could look up the questions or the answers. But <laughs> even back then, I mean, if you look at the history of of, of entertainment. Um, the interesting thing is that pornography has always been there, mm -hmm. but it's never been, if it was as dangerous as the anti-porn people claim, then it should be most of enter enter what entertainment is. And it's not. Like you have sexualized games, but they're never the top games. Mm -hmm. But you have them, they exist. And that's really the role that, you know, sexuality or porn should have in entertainment. It should be there among the other forms of entertainment, but it's not weird like what makes it weird and taboo is the prohibition mm -hmm. i remember just before we move on one thing specifically about that game this is a part of the game that i could never get past you go and you like hire a prostitute um but if you don't buy condoms from the drugstore first and use them when you have sex with a prostitute you die of aids wow yeah see this is this is this is uh... I bet that they thought that was a progressive thing to teach safe sex. And in fact, it was scaring. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, oh my God, like yeah, yeah. What, the stigma. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to ask you just a couple more questions for my Patreon members. Mm -hmm. um, so Hugo uh, asks, how did you get started writing for the adult industry? Would your experience writing for the adult industry negative Im negatively impact you if you were to write for a mainstream publication? Um, this is actually a whole ton of questions. Okay. Uh, we won't get into all of them because some of them we already we already answered. Um, let, let's start with those because okay. there's like three more. I think I might have said this the first time that I came here, but I was I was working for LA Weekly, uh, which was a great great publication in Los Angeles. And then in 2017, it got bought by some terrible people. So now uh, we all pretend it doesn't exist anymore because what it's turned into is this other thing but i was there from 2009 till 2017 like right until they got bought bought up and uh they wanted they wanted nsfw content they wanted they wanted boobs basically boobs pictures and they were trying to find different ways to do it and i one day i went to this editor and said hey we have the adult industry here why don't we try to cover it in a way that is not stigmatizing that covers it like the other branches of of entertainment um you know that is sex worker positive it's the same thing that i'm doing now but for for mainstream and uh i started writing some articles for them and taking photos for them and uh eventually i i, I started writing for other magazines about the industry mainstream magazines about the industry. And then I started working for Expis uh, in 2018, 19. Um, and so I started covering the industry from within it. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you feel that, so I guess this next question is, would your experience writing for the adult industry 
negatively impact you if you were to want to write for a mainstream publication? Basically, do you feel that the stigma of writing for the adult industry would follow you if you try to get a job outside? Well, of I always say I'm not a sex worker. I'm, I'm stigma adjacent. <laughs> I'm sex worker adjacent. Uh, yeah, sure. There, there, there are implications. There, there's sometimes there's been times when you know I felt that you know I had a little bit of the scarlet letter, but nowhere near somebody who actually does the job. Yeah. I would not take that. You know, uh, uh, no, I would not claim that. Uh, I'm I'm way way privileged by doing this and by not by not putting my asshole on camera. You know, it's just I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> not putting myself out like a lot of people are, uh, uh, which is very brave of them. Yeah, I have to say uh, in that same vein, you know, I mean, I, I definitely face stigma probably more than you do just because, you know, I'm, I'm more in the adult industry, but though I also don't consider myself a sex worker. Um, but I, I my eyes work. I mean, I always obviously I know that sex workers face incredible stigma. Um, and vitriol from the general public. But I guess I didn't, sometimes it becomes very apparent to me. So I uh, interviewed Adriana Chechik for mm -hmm. my podcast and I put out um, a reel uh, when I, like, as I always do, when I promote my show on Instagram and I added her as a collaborator and she accepted. And so, you know, the, the reel went out to all of her fans on her Instagram too. And the comments that came through were just like, astounding to me. I mean, I definitely get negative comments here and there, especially on YouTube. Um, but the things that people were saying to her, like on Instagram, stuff that she sees yeah. every day. Yeah. I just was like, I mean, people were like, fuck you, whore, you should die. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it was just crazy. And I was like, wow, you know, it was just yeah. this real insight into, you know, what I know sex workers experience, but I, ha I, it was very much in my face and I was, I was rather taken aback by that. Yeah, yeah, it's um, you know. And these are people that choose to follow her, just so they can say horrible things to her. Yeah. It's like if you don't agree with what she does, that's fine, but why are you following her just to attack her? It's just crazy. It's painful. It's just painful. And also, I mean, but those are knuckleheads. Uh, they're going to exist everywhere. Yeah. Uh, um, but the institutional stuff, you know, like discrimination i mean this person was asking if i would be discriminated if i wrote i mean i i don't know because i like what i cover i like the industry that i cover but to be frank like i i don't think the mainstream is interesting in what i do mm -hmm. it's uh, it's interested in what i do mm -hmm. um th there are some reporters that cover uh adult industry and adult beat but it's not from the point of view that i cover it mm -hmm. Uh, there are some good reporters in mainstream, but in general, there is not like the LA Times would not be interested in having coverage of the adult industry, and they should because they're the leading paper in Los Angeles, and this is where the core of the industry is. Yeah, uh, Las Vegas paper should have an adult industry. Yeah. yeah. His next question was, how can writers from mainstream publications improve their writing when talking about the sex industry? I mean, I guess the answer would just be educate yourself, right? Yeah, and just figure out why they're doing it. like that. That's I mean, that's what I said. What I said when I started writing, and th this was just me just thinking. Well, this would be a good thing, but it ended up being like a good, a good, you know, through line for me to think. Well, am I covering this the same way I will be covering any other type of entertainment? When I write features now, I write occasionally. I write features for the print version of Xbiz where I cover a performer or a, or a new uh, site. And if you read them, it would be the same that if I was interviewing, you know, Aubrey Plaza or like any, you know, anybody who has a show on TV right now. Mm -hmm. That's how I write the features, and that's originally my idea when I was at Exvis. Uh, sorry, at LA Weekly was like, how can we cover this in a way that is compelling? It fits into the whole um, entertainment coverage that happens in Los Angeles and it's sex worker positive and not stigmatizing. Mm -hmm. So whenever somebody tries to write about the industry, that's what I tell them. Just before you start, just think, what are your through lines? What do you want to say about this? Because your editor might want to have, your editor, your editor may have an agenda and may want you to do this for some reason. So ask, Ask them why are they covering, why are they interested in this topic? And then talk to a lot of the people who do that, not just the people, 
and not just the people who have publicists, you know, because we always see the same five people quoted in all the articles. Um, just, you know, try to, that's, that, that's one of the advantages of Twitter. Like you can look at a broad sample of different types of people, different career levels, time spent in the industry, segments of the industry. They don't necessarily have to be, you know, gorgeous, cis, straight women. Like you can, you can just like go, you know, go mm -hmm. wide. Just get get a good sample of what pornography is like in 2022. Yeah, because I mean, one thing that I always try to impress upon people is that the porno pornography in the porn industry is not just one thing. No. It's not just one person. It's just not one style of movie. It's like collective of so many different kinds of people and so many different kinds of visions and opinions and styles and i think that that's something that a lot of people miss yeah yeah, yeah. for sure um and a lot of people also may be focused on what they're interested in and i find that the anti-porn people in particular it's funny to hear them talk when they describe what they think porn is mm -hmm. that tells a lot about them mm. yeah that tells a lot about them. I always find it fascinating that it's one of the last, you know, it's one of the last, I think it's one of the last social taboo subjects is to ask people what kind of porn they like. Yeah. People freeze when you ask them that. Yeah. And it's funny. It's interesting because they want to keep it private in a kind of way. Yeah. Uh, but you can tell a lot about people, the way they describe what they like. Yeah. Yeah. All right, last question. Uh, this is from Mark Cunningham. Um, he said, not sure if Gustavo would have read it, but what, so would, what did he think of the piece by Elizabeth Nolan Brown in the May 2022 issue of Reason Magazine? Um, he provides a link, which obviously I can't click on because this is paper. Um, but uh, it looks like the title is New Campaign for a Sex-Free Internet. And then he goes on to say, to be honest, I had actually suggested to Catherine Mangu Ward that Reason should have a collaboration article between Elizabeth and Gustavo. Will Gustavo be interested in such a collaboration in the future? Well, thanks thanks for um, pointing out that article. I am quoted in that article. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm, not only have I read it, I'm in it. So you didn't read it. <laughs> I'm in it. Uh, no, yeah, like you probably uh, forgot that line where it said, but yeah, I'm quoted in that article. and. Um, yeah, she's fantastic. She's a fantastic reporter. She's one of the people who like cover things really, really well there. And uh, uh, it's interesting because Reason, of course, is the libertarian kind of magazine. And I, I know she takes a lot of, because there is this debate, the conservative debate has moved into the, the libertarian world where like libertarians are very conflicted about the whole, you know, the takeover of MAGA and the insurrection and, you know, it's a lot of so-called controversy in the in the libertarian sphere of, of discourse about what's happening right now to to the right and conservatism and those kind of things. So I know I know Elizabeth takes a lot of it's a lot of people who are very aggressive towards her because of her defense of sexual expression. And I think it's very brave of her to just stick to her guns and continue producing the work she's doing. Yeah. If you guys are interested in uh, more on Elizabeth Nolan Brown, I actually did interview her for this podcast as well. So you can go back and uh, find it. And, She's great. Uh, Some of the best. She is great. And Elizabeth, if you're watching this also to your kid is super cute. <laughs> I love her baby pictures on the internet. Oh, yeah. Definitely. I wish I could post pictures of my baby, but I have too many weird people following me. So. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Uh, Gustavo, thank you so much for, for coming. Me. It's always so great to have you on. I know that my Patreon members specifically like love hearing from you. Um, you provide such valuable insight into the industry and you also like do such important work for us. So from the bottom of my heart and everybody else thank you. in the adult industry, I just Same. want to thank you. Same. I really, I really love watching the podcast, uh, listening to it in the car. Fantastic. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online, please? Well, I, I, on Twitter, I'm Gustavo Turner X, but I'm I'm taking a little break. Twitter is weird these days, so I'm on Mastodon too. As Gustavo, Tur okay, I'm going to try to do my Mastodon for the first time. At Gustavo Turner, at mstdn dot social. So it's Mastodon without the vowels dot social. Uh, yeah, I've been doing my. My Twitter posting, I've been doing it on Mastodon since uh, Twitter got a little weird. 
Uh, and then on Instagram, my Gustavo Turner. Uh, and that's where you can see my photos, which is something I really love to do. And we talk about that. That's something else we share in common. Yes, yes. Yeah, I know your photography is really cool. Um, and you guys, of course, can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. If you want to support this podcast and be able to submit questions like all of the ones that um, my current patrons did for my guests like Gustavo and anybody else, you can join us at patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us, and I will see you next week. <laughs>